Today we're going to talk about the economy. Where is it? What is it? Why is it? How is it? Give. <laughs> so we're going to talk about what what's planned for the star citizen economy, um, the, the people behind the planning, and why we haven't found it or seen it yet. Uh, it's going to be a long one, I think. We have a few pretty long videos to go through here. So we're going to start here with talking about what we've really been starting to see as of late, which are new locations, um, distribution centers, derelict settlements, colonial outposts, and the different types of space stations are all super, super important because they represent the economic nodes in the system, which are the underlying foundation of the economy. I think part of the reason we haven't seen the economy as much yet is because they just haven't had enough of these economic nodes. Like they, we have, gosh, I don't, maybe 30 UGFs in the system, uh, four cities, 12 space stations. Overall, like we have less than 60 locations. And I think given the number of people in a server and the number of locations we have, the scale might not be enough. But when you listen to this sort of explanation they have about how economic nodes affect the economy, it it kind of starts to explain why they need to start pumping out more of these locations, which we've seen a ramp up of in the last couple of years. So this is, I think, one of the biggest signs that they are making progress towards what they want to do. And I think we've heard some messaging on this, something like this last year. But anyways, here that is. So let's talk about economic nodes now. An economic node is- I, I do, by the way, I have him sped up a little bit because this is the, <laughs> you know what? I'll play it at real time. It's just going to sound ridiculous if I speed it up. Here we go in the game, which might be represented via an actual storefront, a kiosk, a UI interface, or an NPC that possesses an item manifest detailing the items it wants to buy or sell, storage capacity, and a fair bit of data related to determining prices. This includes refineries that process ore, factories that produce goods, and retail stores where you buy finished products. Factory inputs aren't explicitly denoted, but are instead derived from the production formulae of whatever they manufacture. Prices, what economic nodes are willing to pay for their inputs and what they want in order to sell, are determined algorithmically based upon the rate of change of their, of their inventory versus the tangent of a pricing curve. This means that they're smart enough to, say, raise the price of what they're selling even when their inventory is low if they detect that they're being resupplied at a sufficient rate to get where they want to be in a reasonable amount of time. So clearly there's some dynamism happening here, which is fantastic. Just Unfortunately, super, that's super where the fantastic. good news ends. So like we're starting to see we're starting to see some of these locations, refinery, factory. These are like we've seen refineries at the new uh, outposts they're building. And we've seen factories, I think, are distribution centers are the kind of things that means retailers, just the stores we already shop at. As with missions, economic nodes don't have any real context in terms of supply and demand, and there's no systemic flow of goods throughout the economy. Why does a refinery want ore? Where does the shop get the goods that it's selling? Right now, the answer to all these questions is the same. We fake it. Economic nodes conjure up their own supply and demand out of Hot thin air. If a node get is here. designated <laughs> as wanting to purchase a particular item, for example, designers dictate a formula that describes how that inventory will be gradually burned. Yo, Anthro with the one sub. Thank you so much. These Appreciate you as well. Ten months and the shaken, shaken no tomato. Real demand. This is impossible to balance because while production and consumption are fixed, the player count isn't. Sometimes a hundred players are interacting with an economic node, and sometimes none. And I mention this because behind the scenes, uh, at the economic level, all of the players, despite being on different servers, really are connected to one single system. A real economy is a tangled web of dependencies, and you can't expect logical results when its gears can completely seize up due to the action or inaction of players. What we really need then is NPC I feel like that's exactly what happens now. <laughs> well, no, it's actually not because of our inaction. It's because there's just not enough action regulation of the system for NPCs to purchase items when they need them, thus keeping the demand side logical, while stepping in to help with the supply when players don't and the risk reward warrants it. This has ripple effects into other areas. If the demand for missiles spiked because there was a lot of combat, you'd expect that the commodities used to construct those missiles would start to rise in price. And you'd also expect to see more miners and freighters working to alleviate that shortage. If the price got high enough that those transports would be carrying a lot of value, 
So you know, you'd expect piracy to increase, at which point you should start to see a lot more security patrols and requests for combat escorts. A simple change in demand then should be able to alter not only what you see as you travel throughout the system, but also the available missions. These kinds of knock-on effects, in fact, should happen regardless of whether any player is in an area. And that's a separate problem I'll talk about more when we get to probability volumes. Which is, okay, so this is where he's going to, this kind of puts it into graphical terms. But after this, I'm going to switch pretty far ahead here because all of this is going to be repeated in the next video in much better ways. But I do want to show you the initial version here of the, uh, I believe this would be Odin. This might be Odin or... There's so many names, Quantum, Quasar, Odin, uh, Quanta, like, I don't, I don't quite remember, but we'll get to that stuff in a bit, and then we're going to skip through this video a little bit. So let's take a quick look at what it means to set up an economic node. As I mentioned, there are about 225 economic nodes within the Stanton system, and many of them deal with a lot of different items. Each of these items can specify its own production. Or Wait, what did he just say? A lot of different, about 225 economic nodes. Okay, so like when I counted and I said like, what did I say? 60 something? I was so far off, you probably shouldn't even listen to the rest of this video. <laughs> no, but 225 nodes. Let's see what he has to say about that. It's within the Stanton system and many of them deal with a lot of different items. Each of these items can specify its own production or consumption formula along with a lot of other information, storage space, uh, optimal inventory level, price offsets, and much more. This information can be archetyped, but of course the world's a lot more interesting if every economic node is a bit different. So there's still a lot of customization that winds up happening. So now let's take a look at the economic nodes around a typical planetary system. Cough, cough. <laughs> See, remember, and remember how I keep saying, remember how I keep saying that like this Citizen Con they just did, they mastered the whole presentation and like selling the features they were showing. And then look back at a presentation like this. It's not bad, but it's certainly not, it doesn't, it doesn't build your hype quite as much. And you'll see even in the next presentation that we look at for the same system, they get a little bit better year after year. Economic nodes around the entire Stanton solar system. That's a tremendous amount of data to set up and maintain as we're routinely adding new items and changing prices. And the worst part is that it's all extremely rigid. There's no way to have an economic node increase how much of something it produces or consumes because those things are attached to formulae that have no understanding of external events. So right now, designers try their best to brute force this stuff, to make it feel like it's a systemic world, even if it's not. If an area is configured to have a lot of pirates, they increase the price offsets and demand for goods at nearby nodes. If the number of pirates is subsequently decreased or maybe more security is added to the area, then the nodes are updated to reflect that fact. It's a ton of work, and while this sort of hand tweaking does yield something that feels vaguely logical, if static, it's definitely not a real solution, and it doesn't even begin to address the major problems. Now we come to the last of the major areas for which I wanted to illustrate the problems that we currently face. So what is a probability volume? A probability volume is an area of space that contains information detailing what you should see as you pass through the area. It's an optimization of sorts in that it allows us to achieve a desired effect, a certain number of pirates in an area or a particular likelihood of encountering a freighter filled with iron So this ore is that part that I said I was going to skip. So this probability volumes, we'll get back to that. Basically, probability volumes is like, hey, you just ran into a stranded freighter. But this is, this is the real, this is the real interesting stuff here. So this is the initial concept of how this whole background simulation will run on their end. Honestly, I would love to have this as a game for ourselves. This looks pretty sick. But this is their kind of interface to understand what's going on in the game at the time. Now, I don't know if this was actually running in real time back at that time. Um, but this was very much pitched in a way that hyped up the economy. Remember, this presentation is from 2019 and we still don't have this. So this is some of those kinds of things that people point to when they're like, hey, they'll talk about stuff, but we'll never get it. So, yeah. Totally anticlimactic to say, here are all the players and three dots showed up. <laughs> So let's go ahead and continue the tour of the solar system and jump on over to uh, Daymar. 
And you can see a number of people affixed to the planet. Some of those obviously are going to be at outposts. Some of them are inevitably mining. Um, over there on the right, you can see the, the current player list. Let's go ahead and see what a couple players are up to. Just go ahead and highlight them so we can see where they're at. And let's go ahead and jump to Circo Worm and see where he's at. Yo, John, thank you for the sub. I see it's you. We got 30 months, John, in, it looks in the like chat. He's in Lorville. Love you, dude. Hope you're doing well. Happy New Year's. Here he is. Hi, buddy. And you can actually see some deaths down on the planet there. So this is basically just allowing them to so, see player activity in real time. These are the probability so volumes here, that they mentioned. Like I mentioned. There are a variety of different types um, and lots of different content and thematic tags for all these things. So you can see everything from the default tags. You can see the... If you look closely on this screen, it's kind of... You, you miss this stuff because he just doesn't point it out. But up here, you can see that it has ratings of percentage per minute. And what that means is... It's, it's a percentage of encountering whatever this graph stands for in that minute. So every minute that percentage resets, and at that distance, whatever distance you are from the planet, the probability lowers. So right here, you might be at an 18% chance per minute of seeing a, what is this, police. But if you go 672 kilometers out, that might be a 9% chance. And that, that occurs for bounty hunters, for police, um, for pirates, for freighters, and it changes based on the relationship between each other. So more police means more freighters means less pirates. More freighters means more pirates could mean less police, but could also mean less pirates because there's more police. And that whole idea is supposed to account for every planetary body there is. I don't know if it accounts for space stations. I guess it probably is every, every location, so outposts and cities too. But we've seen this applied to planetary systems. Security reinforcement tags, the bounty hunter tags, the spoofing tags. Um, there are a number of these. We'll be adding more. In general, what it's doing is, as I mentioned, uh, it's basically representing things in probabilistic state because it's too expensive for us to fully simulate them. Um, now let's go ahead and jump over to a shop. Let's check out the Hicks Research Station that's on Selen. Yeah, we've got to go over to Crusader. And let's go ahead and open up that shop. Oh, look, here's... Yep, there's Outpost Korea, and you can see that there's a lot of, a lot of death around there. <laughs> and over on the right at the Hicks Research Station, you can see all the things that it buys and sells and what those prices have been doing over time. I love how there's just like <laughs> have been doing abandoned building. Okay. Over time. Sure. Yeah, I know that place. Now, I suspect I know what you're thinking at this point. This is all very cool, but it doesn't really solve any of the fundamental problems that I mentioned earlier, and that's totally true. So let's clear the board and get to that. Let's see. Mark my words, the next time they do a presentation on this program, it's gonna be night and day from this in terms of like just how well prepared it is. They're, God, their citizen con this year was so good. So, I'm a fan. The primary reason for quantum's existence is to enable us to have one unified world where we can, you know, simulate millions of NPCs and feed back into that all of the player actions into one unified whole. So there's really no difference. There are some optimized areas, the probability volumes that exist in between these two, you know, these two realities, but really this, you know, th this is this is the full-blown simulation. It takes into account all the player actions. So, let's go ahead and start by bringing a thousand quanta to life. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> y'all don't get me started on it, but I'm going to draw emphasis to the fact that he did indeed call the actual AI quanta, while the system, as you can see up in here, the, the actual simulation of the game is called quantum. I just, I'll try not to say that too many times throughout this stream, but I, uh, that's my, that's my thing. And I'll, I'll die by that.
a thousand quanta to life. You on the wrong one? In anybody's defense, it's their own fault for naming the system quantum and the things quanta and the travel method quantum and the fuel quantanium. <laughs> it's just... Streaming in from another system. Oh, God. These are simulated entities. Also important to remember that when CIG says that the game is, or the economy is a nine to one scale, doesn't necessarily mean nine to one NPCs, although I'm not smart enough to translate how that would even matter, but this is what they are talking about. Nine to one AI simulating the economy in the background. The, the real significance of this is when you're talking about working out the vast multitude of details that we really need to allow this universe to evolve and feel dynamic, we don't actually need all of the incredibly high fidelity, super computationally expensive stuff that we would get if we were actually simulating these NPCs the traditional way on the server so that they look exactly like they would when you see them. These NPCs don't need to do animations. They don't need to do physics. They don't need to do uh, collision detection. They don't need to do a whole slew of things that we couldn't afford to do. It would be incredibly expensive to try. And in the end, even if we did it, it wouldn't make the end results any more accurate. So. They also have uh, personality traits, too. Like each yep. one has a little bit yep. of something going on. Yeah, there are a number of different traits um, that we're modeling. We're still working out the exact configuration. Um, one of them is ambition, and that specifies how far a quantum can push themselves relative to others, whether in crime or legitimate enterprise. Another one is intelligence, and that dictates what sort of things they can pursue and how well they can do something. Uh, happiness is a measure of whether a quantum the singular form of quanta is miserable or content, and unhappy quanta want to change their situation, move to a new location, change occupations, and that sort of thing. Aggression controls the lengths to which a quantum will go to achieve their objective. A business-oriented quantum with a lot of aggression might push their workers harder, trading their happiness for more profit, and as a result have to deal with more turnover. And lastly, criminality, that determines the amount of criminal behavior that a quantum will consider. Uh, no criminality so again, you a law. all of this stuff he's going to go through in more detail in the next video, but this is this is related to virtual AI, and I'm actually going to take us for a little bit of a detour into bounty hunting to talk about how virtual AI will will likely be the first really obvious sign of this whole system that we see. Um, but here is sort of this is looking at how this whole system is meant to work, and I think this gives us the best look at their overall goal of Star Citizen. Um, now that they've included base building, it adds a little bit on to the end, but I think this gives us the overall goal of how they want the game loop to work in terms of finding things, acquiring things, refining things, crafting things out of them, and then selling those things. We're supposed to be taking parts on every one of those steps. So they show us that broken down here, um, just in this presentation. We're gonna go ahead and add an aluminum refinery to Crusader. And immediately, you will see the quanta start springing to life. And what's happening is they've all figured out they've that refinery it wants to build up a stockpile of aluminum, and in order to do that, it needs some raw aluminum ore, and thus it's willing to pay for it. And so the quanta are, are seizing upon that economic opportunity, heading out to Delamar, doing the work, extracting that ore, and taking it back to the refinery. And this will continue until it, you know, until it's until it's full. So let's go ahead and open that card up again, and we can watch the refined aluminum ore gradually build up. You can also see the number of workers. A few of the quanta, so you see many of them actually acting as miners. There's also a number of them that are working uh, in that refining factory. Refineries can't process this material um, you know, uh, w without labor, and there's a formula that dictates how much labor is, is required in order to process this stuff. And so they have to hire a sufficient number of workers in, act in order to actually uh, execute this operation. And so this would continue for quite a while. Let's go ahead and speed up the simulation a bit. 
and go ahead and keep watching the aluminum inventory is that's finished so they're now building up their raw ore to basically load up and after that the entire economy comes to a halt there the one refiner we've added has no more incentive to buy more it's it's its storage houses are already full and therefore it's not willing to buy since it's not willing to buy the quanta have nothing to do so what we're going to do now is at a factory but before we do that, let's head on. So this is really the part of the economy that matters to all of us, right? It's like seeing seeing the demand go up or down based on the based on the qualities of the market we're in. Stanton. And we don't really get that from AI or even from ourselves making that much of a difference. Um, there are a few things they said have been linked into this system. Fuel, repair, and um I think it's just refueling and repair costs. Those are supposed to change based on where you are and what's going on in the area. The problem is those aren't commodities. So it's not like we're scaling those, like we're not buying 400 SCUs of fuel. So we can't notice how much of a difference you, you get. You know, if you're selling one barrel of fuel, you're going to notice that 10% increase on demand over if you're selling, or you're going to notice it a lot less compared to if you sell 300 barrels and you get 10%, right? So... Because they didn't apply that to commodities, we don't really notice whether or not the quantum economy is working, but they say that it is partially in the game and it has been running. So they've been collecting some form of data and they've been trying to do some things with it. And we do know that they're building um, global events like Blockade Runner that do work off of some of these systems. But it's been four years since this presentation. Uh, yeah, four and a half years. So people are, you know, rightfully curious about where it's where it's going to be and We'll keep going through this um, today's deep dive with all these different videos and hopefully find an answer for when it might be coming soon. When it might be coming soon. <laughs> I feel like I just inserted my own bias there. Let's get back to this. You'll see how that factors into what they're planning. Head on over to the power plant formula. And you can see here that building a power plant um, just like refining ore requires something. It requires 10 workers working for a duration of 60 ticks. And it also notably requires two units of refined aluminum ore to, in order to produce one power plant. It's got to be more complicated than that, I promise. So. Yes. Again, we're, we're building up. Honestly, all the video games so, that I've ever looked into seem to make it, you just take a couple bars of metal, throw them into an oven, and then you get like a pretty nice supercomputer out of it. Oh. Crafting, Let's go right? ahead and add the factory to Hurston. Hey, you gotta slow down. I'm going too fast there. Slow on down. And so once again, you see the, see the economy spring to life. And so now you've actually got two different tiers going. The factory... Let's go ahead and open up the factory. The factory, just like the refinery, needs workers in order to build these power plants. It also needs refined aluminum. So now you've got multiple things going on. The factory is willing to buy refined aluminum. Someone has to transport that aluminum from Crusader to Hurston. So some of the quanta are basically working, you know, they're, they're basically working as freighters to move that, you know, to move that product from one location to another. Some of them were working at the factory on Hurston. Some of them were working at the refinery on Crusader. Some of them are heading back to Delamar to actually do more mining. So you've got an entire little, you know, economic cycle going here. However, it's going to wind up coming to a dead end here. Let's go ahead and accelerate it again, just like what we saw before, because eventually the factory fills up all of its warehouses. It can't take any more. It therefore has no more, you know, it has no more need for refined aluminum. That will eventually shut down the refinery, which will in turn eventually kill off the miners. <laughs> and you can see there that the inventory is still building on the aluminum which is why there's still some activity. There's a lot, yeah. But as soon as it's done, it starts flatlining, so you see that yep. the uh, inventory is capped out. Yep, and now they're almost done. The so factory the, has basically got... It's, there's it's, a surplus. It's got all it can handle. The refinery has all of its ha all it can handle. Therefore, the, 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 the entire loop you know, draws to close again. So let's add one more node. A, let's add a shop that sells power plants to ArtCorp.
Slow it down again. And so now the loop is a bit more complicated. The shop is looking, it's a retail shop, it's looking to sell power plants. In order to do that, it needs to be able to buy them for one price, sell them for another. So it adds its markup on, and it, just like the factory that requires transport of the refined aluminum from Crusader to Hurston, it needs the power plants transported from the factory to it. And so if you notice, they're, if the individual quanta, they'll actually have a little translucent circle around them if they're carrying goods. And so you can easily differentiate whether or not the ones that are moving, for example, from Hurston back to the mine are empty. They're going to load up on ore. And then when they're heading from, or back to Delamar, and then from Delamar back to Crusader, um, they've actually all got ore. And so this loop will actually continue indefinitely. And the reason is because we've cheated something for tonight, which, and it sounds very similar to what I was basically saying was a bad idea earlier, which is the shop right now is a simple consumer. It's, bur it's burning off that inventory. The difference here is that the solution to that is very simple in the context of quantum. And the reason is these quanta, the next step of what we'll be working on is they'll actually require ships. Ships require engines. And so all of a sudden there's a real demand for how many power plants do you need? How many ships do you need? It all follows the same you know, logical equations. So let's go ahead and add a bit more economic complexity. Actually, it's like So thus far, we've shown a very basic economic loop. One commodity, one refinery, one factory, and one retail shop. The real world, of course, is far more complicated. You'll have lots of different commodities, refining and production nodes, retail shops, and of course, players in quanta competing against one another for a limited supply of goods and services. It's this competition, this economic natural selection that ensures that things remain in balance, that a logical equilibrium is reached. Should already gone to it. So, next. So, all right. Let me let me skip again. So the, he's continuing to basically just build upon this loop. Um, we can jump ahead here. Yeah, this will kind of give you a better idea of how this scales out to the whole system. There we go. So we've added lots of aluminum, titanium, and degreesium. In the entries that you see on the screen mark system, all of the moons now have deposits. Uh, we've added a bit more laronite, but it's still pretty rare. We've also added a lot of new refineries. We've added cooler and quantum drive recipes to most factories, and they require aluminum, laronite, titanium, and degreesium. The demand for coolers and quantum drives has been introduced, and we've also increased the demand for power plants. And lastly, we've increased, you can see there at the bottom of the screen, the number of quanta from 1,000 to 2,000 so that we've got enough workers to keep the economy humming. Now, previously, we've seen pretty obvious cause and effect. At this point, though, the economy is starting to get pretty complicated. And we can look at a few graphs to see what's going on with some of the prices to uh, see this. And this is one of the most interesting things about a really complicated economy, which is these changes in quantities and prices, the purposeful movement of quanta, this dynamism, these are all opportunities that you'll, you're going to be able to exploit within the game, and they're in constant logical motion. So, let's hit the next one. It'd be a shame if... Uh Somebody came to steal from these people, huh? Yep, we'll bring up the slide. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you gotta bring the slide. <laughs> All right, so now we've, inter we've introduced some, some pirates. Um, let's go ahead, and so you can see that there are four pirate kraken. There's the Nova Riders, Low Riders, Nine Tails, and Dusters. Pirates have to return to one of their bases in order to refuel, rearm. Um, let's go ahead, if you notice, they head to the areas of highest value. Uh, if you, let's go ahead and zoom in there. And you can see that those are missions being created by the NPCs, no different than players would. In other words, you see a lot of deaths on a route that's got a lot of value. Um, and let's go ahead and hover over some of those contracts. These are contracts that are being thrown out by the NPCs on that route. What's happening is, 
the NPCs are basically being, you know, some of the freighters are being picked on by the pirates, the ship is being destroyed, and now that NPC is, has ejected and needs transport back to civilization. And so they're requesting that. And these are missions that would be fed back into the game that you'd see, and you could wind up accepting these. So that's kind of, that's where combat beacon missions are supposed to be coming from. Uh, that's something else actually that's been tied into Quantum besides the commodity prices we mentioned, the fuel and repair. Uh, combat beacons, if you noticed, a lot of them were added kind of in the last couple of years, and they pretty consistently populate your missions. If you want to go take them, you can get pretty good pay for them. But that's supposedly also linked into Quantum, and that's supposed to be directly tied to this kind of thing. If you're in a more dangerous part of space, you'll get more combat beacons. Um, and if you take more combat beacons, supposedly the number will start to go down as the pirates start to leave. Let's go ahead and take a look at uh, Hurston, the coolers yeah, and quantum drives. Check this out. This is where they're operating out of you guys. Right. What do you want to go check out? The Hurston. Let's look at the, what happened to the cooler and quantum drives. Oh, yeah. So since we've now got a lot of pirate activity on that route, we want to see what's happening to the cost of some of those goods. <laughs> For a cool half a million UEC, you can get yourself your own power plant. Oh, yeah, I can barely see that. <laughs> it's actually normal. Piracy is really terrible for economics, you guys. So, <laughs> yeah. So let's go ahead now. You can really see it over at the coolers yeah. where it started at like a really reasonable thing. Like yeah, that's, that's pegged. It's just it's the scale. So basically they were down around 1,000, 2,000, and now they just absolutely skyrocketed in price because so many of the freighters moving, whether it's supplies or moving you know, the finished product from one location to another, are now being intercepted. And these quantas I mentioned earlier, it's like they have various traits, and some of them are very risk averse, and they won't go down routes where you know, there's a significant chance of death. And so to counteract some of this danger, let's go ahead and bring in someone to fight the pirates. So here comes some security. And what you'll notice is that security is drawn to areas of conflict where there's a lot of deaths and such. So they're gonna wind up gravitating towards those areas where there's a lot of piracy. And there you can see, I'm gonna go ahead and over. Go speed it up a little bit, not 200. It's Something to keep in mind, because we have talked yeah. about this uh, during, I guess during, like when we talk about base building at times and people are worried about how much space there is in the game so to build bases. These are the sort of, <laughs> where, where even did they show this? This is, where they're this is the kind of thing that will also, like we, we kind of forget that it's still a space sim um, and space stations will definitely be a thing in this game. So while there will be planets and moons and stuff and people might want the most valuable land, having a space station is probably gonna be way better because it can be wherever you want it to be it can be as big as you want it to be. You're not constrained by land um, and it's easier to get to. And you can put them on trade lanes. So I do think that if they do allow for space station building, um, that's also another reason that base building in general won't be overcrowded by that. That being said, I wanna jump ahead here. We're, we're gonna come back and talk about this cargo gameplay because this is a big part of the economy forming, I believe this year, but we're going to talk a little bit about base building because that's also going to factor into this. Um, the reason that we started this presentation talking about these economic nodes is because we are also going to be one of these economic nodes. And even though refineries and factories and stores already exist in the game, they're going to let us make them. I'm, it's pretty, pretty obvious. I mean, that's kind of speculation. I'm pretty sure they've said that, but I won't say it's fact. Um, but the idea of us being a part of that economic process is definitely, you know, it's it's um, been all but confirmed, if not confirmed. And I believe in this presentation, it will be as well. Uh, let's listen to what Todd Pappy has to say a little bit about how base building might factor into the economy. The on-site where you're actually going to build. So with that, you need to figure out what your goal is. Is it to have a home with a nice view and relax? Is it to have a trading post where you want to create and sell items? Is it to gather resources available and move on to the next area? Or is it to be off-grid and be completely self-sufficient? Yep. 
So with that, with your prep and everything like that, we've got blueprints. So the, the recipes, everything in the game is fabricated from a blueprint. Players acquire blueprints via reputation rewards, um, missions, or rare NPCs. With any blueprint, you can actually do research on it and then create different variations. With materials, ranging from the common to ultra rare, you might find them at the local shop or have to travel around the universe to collect them. Unrefined, refined, simple materials, or even complex components will all go into the fabrication. With this, then you got location, location, location. Let's skip this part. This isn't really that important to the talk today. Uh, we want to talk about... Here we go. This stuff. So this is really where it starts to actually factor into the economy You put your itself. tool down where you want. You launch the drone that is built into the machine. And then from there, this allows the player to access the base building and also land claim mode. With the land claim modes, the player can actually change the size and position of what, what area they want to claim, and it also shows you the cost and taxes associated with it. If it's in a taxable zone and you don't own the land, this interface will default to it. So if you own the land or it's in a lawless area, it will automatically go to base building mode. So with the overhead view of the land, you can actually place down buildings exactly where you want. You can see the resources beneath the surface, and then you can also place multiple buildings before you actually build. So you can see how it will all kind of come together. You'll see the resources that are needed for it. And then you can also switch back and forth between different modes, which are showing off the resource network and, and how you link basically power generators to consumers. And then the player can move or deconstruct existing buildings right now with no charge. Fabrication. So when you, when you basically build these buildings, they don't come with any furnishings. And if you, if, if you didn't bring any with you, then you want to build a fabricator. So depending on uh, what you want to build, there's different sizes of them that support buildings from decorations, armor, weapons, components, and even ships. So like base building mode, you need blueprints resources to craft what you want. Everything fabricated is produced from a, it produces a physicalized entity. Stats and quality will depend on the quality of the materials actually used. This is why once you've done this, that, this is why this is the only reason really we're talking about this today. Um, base building is going to be a huge deep dive. We will be doing that starting from the very beginnings of when they talked about that till now. Um, but for today, I just wanted to talk about this and really draw home the emphasis that they are talking about finding resources and building and creating basically anything in the game. And for that to happen, we have to be able to buy and sell that on the market of the game or else the economy wouldn't work. So you can see from here, it's not necessarily like they're not saying, yes, you will be part of the quantum economy. But if you're making stuff, you're part of the economy and our bases will have to factor into this massive system that we're looking at with Tony Z called quantum. And that's that's the only reason really why I want to show you this. We could finish up a little bit of this talk because it is hyped, but um, that's the emphasis and the point I want to take away from this part of the talk. That and you built your decorations. Now you can actually fill the room the way that you want to fill it. So furnishings can be purchased at different locations or they can actually be fabricated. You can do that via first person or in a dedicated mode in the surveyor's tool. With that, you've got different types of buildings. So you've got utility style, which would be garages, freight elevators, landing pads, storefronts. And then you've got extractors. So with, re with extractors, we want to make sure that nothing in regards to resource gathering is fully automated. A, player, a level of player engagement is always needed. So as Nick talked about before, there are different types of commodities, radioactive, perishable, et cetera. What you'll be doing is pulling out full containers, then from there it'll be repairing, or there's wear and tear associated with it, or even misfires like you saw in Thorsten's talk and Guillermo's talk yesterday. There's also upgrade paths for making them more efficient or resilient. Power generators. This is also, um, uh, okay, I'm gonna get just a little bit distracted. It has to happen at least once. Um, I'm gonna go back to a video they made because this is really important part of engineering. A lot of people are 
unhappy about the amount of effort going into engineering for ships, but there's a lot more than just the ships that they're doing engineering on. They're doing, um, uh, they're going to be doing these bases that we're building are going to have to balance power and resources and, um, gosh, uh, life support. All of these resources we're thinking about for spaceships are going to exist in cities and outposts and space stations. So it's not just a ship system they're building. It's, it's so that this kind of stuff actually makes sense to us. So if you go all the way back to their very first looks at, um, the colonial outpost style, and you'll kind of recognize like this is this is stuff we've been seeing in their presentations recently. Uh, you'll see that they already had these sort of like interactive points planned out and labeled here. Um, little interactive points where you would be managing these power systems or these cooling stations because engineering from you know, I guess this is only 2021. It's not that long ago, but engineering has always been the kind of part of complicating this sort of gameplay and a part of making sure that just because you can go and build that base or just because you can go and buy that ship doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to get you everything you want. It's not going to make, make it so that you're just suddenly winning at everything that you try to do. You still have to plan out and make use of that stuff that you're making. I think that's a huge part of this game that they should double down on because like nobody wants to jump into this game and feel completely out of depth just because they don't have like the money or the 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 people to go and claim a bunch of land smarts gotta build smarts into it so with different types of power generators there there'll be some that are more cost effective as well as effective in different areas solar panels will not always work in darkness fuel generators will need to be filled up every now and then and then batteries to store excess power then you've got producers, so things that will require the players to combine different resources to produce new items. And then you've got defense, so anti-air, anti-personnel, and then shield generators. And that's and then, this is this is the big like people are asking um, like what happens to my base? It's, people can just bomb it from the sky. I think they'll probably give us quite a bit of opportunity to defend our bases to the point where they're basically impenetrable, at least in certain systems. We could go back to this whole talk about um, the safety of space. If you're in a high security place like Stanton, I would assume. Yeah, I, I would think this is like a Stanton sort of system. Um, most places in Stanton would be high security. Um, yeah, and then I think you're just going to be protected almost all the time and be pretty good. But really, this was about understanding how we are going to affect the economy ourselves, how we are going to become part of this economic node system that they're talking about and help to build up what will eventually make Star Citizen run. So then from there, we're actually going to jump back in time again to the following year. Or I guess the same... the. Wait, what year is this? 2019. So two years after that first presentation we watched, Tony, Tony Z came back to give us a more polished and I think better understanding of what this whole system is going to be. The kicker here is we're going to talk about virtual AI. And the whole reason I'm talking about this presentation today is because virtual AI, I think, will be the actual addition of the quantum economy this year. I don't know if they're going to get all this quanta simulation stuff going, but virtual AI we need for bounty hunting. And I'm pretty sure they want to push that out this year, although they wanted to push it out last year. So that's never really that indicative. But either way, it's fun to talk about. So let's let's talk about it. Here you go. Tony Z, give him a swing. ...of development and will sometimes resort to illustrative examples so that the underlying concept can be made more clear. First, a quick review. Quantum is a simulation of the game universe, and its purpose is to allow things, the price of goods at a given shop, the amount of piracy near a landing zone, or what missions are being offered, to evolve and change over time in logic. Just, just one more time, I'm going to point it out. Keep in mind, he's trying to make it very clear that the, the economy is called quantum. And after this, he'll say that the, the individual simulations inside of the economy, that the AI are called quanta. Last time, I promise. People in realistic ways. It does this by simulating hundreds of thousands of lightweight NPCs called quanta, whose AI logic is focused on just those aspects needed to produce the required information. Based upon a small list of attributes, each quanta makes its own decisions using the same resources, shops, and jobs as players. 
The simulation will need to calculate many millions of decisions per minute, and thus the AI behavior of Quanta is focused on the most economically impactful details, which lets Quantum focus all of its processing power on just those things that truly matter. Every Quanta possesses its own unique set of attributes that influence how well it performs and how it perceives opportunities. The initial implementation of attributes will have two main categories, proficiencies and traits. Proficiencies act like a multiplier on how well Quanta perform a given task. Different jobs will require different proficiencies, and higher proficiencies will equate to superior execution. Traits describe what kind of jobs a Quanta prefers to do by modifying their perceived value of the job. Each job will have a specific alignment, and when a Quanta's traits match up with the job's alignment, they will perceive the payout of that job to be higher. To illustrate the concept, let's take two jobs on either end of the aggression scale and suppose, for now, that they pay out the same. Now, let's create a quanta with an average aggression rating. This quanta is no closer to the aggression alignment of factory worker than they are to security, so it's no surprise that for this quanta, the payout for both jobs looks the same. However, as we decrease the aggression rating of this quanta, we can see that the perceived amount of money for both jobs changes. Again, the actual pay hasn't changed at all, only the perceived value from that quanta's point of view. It's still possible for the quanta to choose security, but in this case, security would need to pay four times as much. If we change this quanta's aggression trait to be very high, the opposite happens. Now, the aggressive security job looks like it pays much more, and the peaceful factory worker jobs appear to pay much less. Of course, jobs have more than a single trait to distinguish themselves. Suppose we take another aggressive job, pirate. With just one dimension, the pirate job would look just as lucrative to this quanta as a security job. We can differentiate between these two jobs by adding the morality trait and putting both of these aggressive jobs on the proper place on that scale. Okay, so this is... Now this is obviously getting a little bit away from the macro simulation and more towards AI programming. Um, and we've actually, if you go to the presentation from CitizenCon this year, um, CitizenCon, uh, life in the first person, this one, and you jump out to where they're talking about kind of how AI act, you'll see that they are, this is like, this is something that they're doing on both the combat and the sort of proficiency side that he's talking about. But the idea of customizing AI to do certain things in different scenarios, uh, it tracks across a lot of what they're doing with AI. I think this is really kind of cheeky because they talk about this idea that players in AI will be doing all the same things. So if you're in a system like Pyro and there's not many people there and you put out a distress beacon that you need fuel, it's going to go out to NPCs and, and people probably no people are going to want to answer it first, but there is a chance that NPCs that particularly have certain types of affinities might not take that, that beacon for whatever reason. And that would be the reason why eventually a player might have to pick that up. And I think it's kind of cool because that makes a system where you'll always get helped. Not always, depends on where you are. You'll, you'll generally run into somebody that can help your situation but it will likely be factored through npcs first and i guess the idea would be that as nobody comes to get you you would just ramp up the cost more and more until as he's saying here the perceived pay is enough for that npc or that ai that simulated to accept the beacon and give you the services that you're asking for that's i think that's how they they want this to work I think it's a cool system if it does work that way. That's what it seems to point to for me, but it also sounds really complicated. I'm not a doctor, so I don't actually know, but games, man. Now that all jobs have a unique combination of trade alignments, we can watch the perceived payout for all three of these jobs change, even though, in this case, all jobs actually pay the exact same amount. We're currently experimenting with four different traits, but expect to add at least a few more over time to help ensure that quanta do not congregate around the highest paying job at any given moment, and instead, just like a real population of individuals, all perform their own unique mental calculus to determine what looks most appealing to them, and in effect gives us the nice distribution of workers that we want. The quantum simulation right. that we ran at the last- So we're gonna skip ahead a little bit here to here is actually this is this is a pretty interesting this will available talk a little bit about um resource scattering and spawning and that's i guess that's pretty important because now we're getting salvage we're getting mining we're starting to actually care about resources and how we get them and there isn't a ton of logic around finding them right now um 
and not much messaging on how that's going to work in general. So this, I think, sheds a little bit of light on that process, at least. Service is more general purpose and will also be a key component in the implementation of a number of other upcoming features, including everything from cargo loading and unloading to repair, refuel, and restocking services. The refining service provides game servers with the ability to retrieve a refiner's available processing capacity and a price quote for a given quantity of material with the specified speed and quality options. These new services exemplify the way that development nowadays often proceeds, which is to ensure that all of the linkage to and from the data source is properly abstracted from the start, such that once Quantum can provide the necessary data, we can flip a switch to activate it. Previously, when Quanta traveled to a planet or a moon to mine a resource, they picked a random location on the surface. This meant that Quantum wasn't yet capable of generating the spatial fidelity we needed so that we could properly determine exactly where NPCs should and shouldn't be found. The resource service that we completed last year, however, provides Quantum with an API that not only gives it access to this information, but also enables those amounts to be modified so that as players in Quantum mine an area, it will gradually be depleted. To demonstrate, I brought up a planet. Now, I'm going to highlight the location of all of the gold ore. Players in Quanta, of course, would not have this information, and to represent that fact, I'm going to place a shadow over everything. You can see a single quant exploration ship approaching the planet from the right. As it travels across the surface, it will unveil the quantity and location of that ore, visually represented by removing the shadow, and then broadcast that information to other quanta within its organization. It has discovered a huge vein of valuable ore, and quanta miners have now started arriving in mass to extract it. They're focusing predominantly on those areas where the concentration is known to be highest, although they'll also consider things like the amount of risk in a given area, perhaps caused by a player or NPC organization fighting to control that region. I'm running this at an accelerated rate, and you can see that the amount of ore at that first large site is declining rapidly. The explorer has now discovered a second field of gold ore near the equator, and because the original deposit has now been mined so extensively, what remains is more time consuming and difficult to extract and is thus relatively less attractive. The quanta have figured this out, and most of them have started to focus their attention on the newer site. Taken together, these new features allow Quantum to generate a lot more detailed information, which will in turn result in a better and more realistic gameplay experience. Quantum will know where exactly on the surface of a planet NPCs might be found and what they should be doing. It will understand the value of knowledge and factor its acquisition, sharing, and sale into its calculations, including what any information you eventually attempt to sell would be worth. It's also why you as a miner might not actually get blown up as much as you think, even if there are pirates around. There's going to be a lot of NPCs getting blown up. Um, now let's shift gears a little bit. We're still talking about the economy, economy um, or we're still talking about the simulation and, and quantum, but we're going to actually jump into bounty hunting just a tad bit here. Not too much. There's not actually that much to know about it. Oh, I actually think I already have this video pulled up. Yeah. So bounty hunting itself is a pretty simple. Um, it's pretty simple part of the game right now. You just fly somewhere, you blow somebody up and they die and you get paid. Fairly, it's kind of barbaric, actually. Like Stanton, fix your stuff. We don't even, there's no trial. <laughs> hey, the poets, happy ha uh, Halloween. Happy holidays, dude. Thank you for the sub. Appreciate you, man. Been sub for five months here. Homie. It's good seeing you at Citizen Con, dude. I hope you had a good New Year's and Christmas. Um, so yeah. Bounty hunting is like really, really simple right now. And it doesn't... They're going to have to scale up the pay based on the time. But right now you can basically complete a bounty mission in 10 minutes. Get your ship, fly somewhere and blow them up. In the future you're going to have to log into different services to track down your target. You're going to have to use the ATC, the um, the, the custom systems at, at, at cities, different places, comma rays. You're going to have to log into those systems and see where your target was getting pinged by these comma rays and then go to that area and track them down. Um, when you find them, you can't just kill them. They might be dead or alive wanted, so you might have to restrain them, put them in your ship, you might need special drop pods that you can actually use to, um, oh man, where am I going to find, you know, I probably couldn't find that footage. I think we found it earlier, actually. Didn't we find it the other day when I was looking for 
bounty hunting footage, you're going to have to use special drop pods, put your target into the drop pod, take them all the way back to the jail, and then you'll get paid. Obviously, that'll take a lot longer, so you need more money. And I believe the way that it's going to work if you're, say, a player who's getting captured by a bounty hunter, you would then have to... Um, you would probably go into the drop pod and that would spawn you back, kind of like we do now with the medical beds. You wouldn't actually have to sit in a pod and just look at the wall for far too long. Okay, so this is April. Let me go back to April real quick and see if we can find this. Um, oh yeah, that's right. That's how we found it last time. It was the only sprint report of the year. That's what they There's said. also... So here is... Home. Here is a look at kind of that last part. Or no, let's let's start with. Man, there's so much footage here. Let me organize a little bit. Let's start with this first. So you find your target and you got to restrain them. Here's some of the work on that. Whoops. From weapon wear. Right, so takedowns is an important part of our uh, stealth encounters. So this is where we're going to add... Not that one, sorry. We all know how to take down. You can do that. You can take down. Not a problem. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to a new weapon. A new item, sorry, and that's the restraints. So with the restraints, okay, let's take him down first. One more. <laughs> Oh, okay, so with the restraints, we're going to turn him over, we're going to cuff his hands, we're going to cuff his legs. Now, if he wakes up, he can't chase us down, right? But he could call out for help. So what we're going to do as well is we're going to add places in the environment where you can stash a body. You can hide them, either in unconscious or dead. And there were, that way it should be easier to remain undetected and keep you in that stealth bubble. Um, now, so this is another thing. We he's, he's talking about it in the sense of uh, stealth, which is interesting. I mean, it is part of this stealth presentation with takedowns. But really, that's a big part of bounty hunting, too. So if we go back in time to earlier in the year, see what they were saying about bounty hunting um or at least what you would do with a character after you put them into this scenario here's what they have to say for a variety of mission types and down on the surface of hurston work is underway on early white box phase of local law enforcement offices a place for players to utilize the next evolution of bounty hunting gameplay we'll discuss more about later this year to collect or in this case drop off the captured bodies of criminal outlaws collected by players now, the drop-off here is right up front, because in early tests, it was getting kind of weird just walking through the hallways, pushing bodies deeper and deeper into the facility. Unless you're into that sort of thing. Moist noodle. You can then also check out the bounty boards to collect new missions here, or go forward into the shop and resupply as needed. And there's an office for meetings, but who needs more of those in life? And then we bring ourselves to the detention area, where the number of cells can vary from location to location. I suspect that many of you will be looking forward to spending your time anywhere else besides Kleischer, even if it's just a jail and not a prison. Also in white box. So yeah, that's um. That's some of the updates on bounty hunting we have. And I wanted to set that up as sort of the physical side of it um, before we actually talk about what really is going to drive bounty hunting as an overall game loop and what hopefully will be introduced this year as the really the backbone of the new version of bounty hunting that is virtual AI. All right, so here is virtual AI. This is the backbone of bounty hunting. And honestly, this this will determine a lot of, I think, the NPCs and how we determine or how we meet refuelers refiners pirates bounty hunters all those kinds of random npcs you run into the control service that's required for server meshing to the npc scheduler that will enable dynamic populations to the virtual ai service that is necessary for the next major feature i'm going to discuss star citizens ai architecture is broken up into three distinct levels 
The high fidelity characters that you see in the game execute subsumption logic on a server, and this is far and away the most computationally expensive of the three types of AI. It's got a similar sense think act cycle as the other AI, but because you can see the NPCs as they execute their tasks, there's often little to no potential for cheating or simplification. Something as simple as sitting in a chair requires a lot of item searching, animation, ray casting, collision detection, and more. This is a problem because in Star Citizen, we're trying to simulate entire solar systems and we can't afford to execute this kind of expensive logic for tens of thousands of characters that players can't even see. So we do what many games do and temporarily suspend any AI that's not in proximity to a player. This creates another roadblock though, because you can't effectively simulate an economy when portions of it are constantly being shut down and restarted. And it's the fundamental reason why quantum exists. Merging these two AI extremes, subsumption and quantum, solves our basic problem. NPCs look and act exactly as you'd expect when you can see them, and the universe's economic wheels always remain in motion. There's one major flaw, however, with this solution. The heavyweight subsumption NPCs that you can see and interact with don't execute any AI logic when you're not around, and thus they're severely limited in what they can do and when they can do it. Solving this issue is the responsibility of a middle tier of systemic logic that I call virtual AI. Virtual AI allows virtual NPCs, VNPCs for short, to seamlessly transition back and forth between the fully realized and physical world of subsumption and a far more efficient and tangible back into ether where they retain the ability to interface with elements of the systemic architecture just like a player. This technology is going okay. to unleash a lot so, of new and <laughs> um, Basically what that means is it allows an NPC to despawn but still be simulated in the background or it allows that NPC's spirit, the AI, to jump into game and actually be spawned in and rendered for you when it needs to be so it allows them to be very complex ai without without spending all that data and resources to keep them rendered flying their ships engineering their their engines and stuff all in the game uh, at real time exciting gameplay but it's going to take more than a few sentences to properly explain what i'm talking about so let's walk through it all in more detail this is the Stanton solar system. You can see the four planets, Arcorp, Hurston, Microtech, and Crusader. I'm going to zoom into the Crusader planetary area and you can see its three moons, Yella, Damar, and Selen, and the space station Port Olisar. You can imagine looking at that station, hundreds of NPCs going about their lives. This is how you think of the universe, always in motion, always changing, always real, regardless of whether you're actually looking at it or not. Well, not yet. As I mentioned though, that's an illusion. We can't afford it. When you're not looking, the server deactivates and unloads a lot of unnecessary baggage, but a wide assortment of back-end services retain knowledge of everything that really matters and provide an active interface to those systems. NPCs outside of landing zones are treated differently. Quantum accumulates statistical information for where NPCs should reside and what they should be doing from its quanta, which allows us to determine how often you should see a pirate or what a freighter you run into should have in its cargo hold. These areas are called probability volumes, and the important thing to note is that the NPCs they create are ephemeral. They pop into existence for a brief moment so that the area you're viewing looks like what Quantum says it should, and once they're sufficiently far from any players, they're completely and forever destroyed. I'm going to add a player here, which you can see off to the left. As they pass by Daymar, they're in range of a probability volume that, eventually, decides they should encounter a pirate. So, a pirate is created and engages the player, and after a bit, the player decides that they're outmatched and decides to run. Once they're sufficiently far from that NPC, it's destroyed. It doesn't persist in any fashion, and you'll never see them again. The player continues traveling to Port Olisar, and the translucent green wireframe indicates that the area isn't loaded on the server, and thus the subsumption AI isn't active. I'm going to add a VMPC in a moment, but first let's quickly recap what makes them so different. VMPCs always execute some form of AI logic, regardless of whether or not they are in proximity to a player. Virtual AI is extremely lightweight and computationally efficient, stripping out all of the expense related to visuals and unnecessary details, yet retains the full ability to interact with the game in the ways that truly matter. Virtual AI executes within a back-end service and can thus easily be scaled and doesn't put any load on the servers. VMPCs can seamlessly transition back and forth from lightweight back-end driven AI entities to full-blown subsumption driven NPCs and are thus indistinguishable from an NPC that really did execute expensive subsumption logic all the time. Lastly, VMPCs gradually build up their own unique histories as they live out their lives. They evolve. Okay, so back to the example. Once the player gets close enough to Port Olisar, that area is streamed into existence, loaded onto a server and the NPCs initialized to resume whatever they should be doing at that time of day. 
Now I'm going to introduce a VMC pirate near the player, and they're going to immediately attack. After a few moments, the VMPC comes out ahead in this battle, and the player is killed. Hey, it's me. Because their crime was committed in range of an active comrade, it's recorded in their character history, along with the time and location of the felony. An upcoming tracking app will allow you to access information like this if you've registered with the local authorities so that the digital footprints players and VMPCs leave behind can be tracked. This VMPC's name is Dragon, and since they're now wanted in this jurisdiction, the Comrade has affixed a real-time marker to his position. With the only player in this area dead, the server now streams Port Olisar and the Comrade out, but as I previously noted, VMPCs aren't destroyed like a regular NPC created from a probability volume, and their logic isn't suspended like an NPC at a landing zone. Instead, VMPCs simply transition from their physicalized state, where authority over their actions is controlled by subsumption logic executing on a server, to their native ethereal state, where their virtual AI executes on the back end. Dragon now begins to exit the area, and the Comrade continues to track his position until he passes out of range, at which point the real-time information converts to a last known position report. He's decided that he needs money, and he's a bit risk-averse, so he elects to head all the way out to Yella, where there are quite a few transport freighters carrying valuable ore and little in the way of security. Okay, Dragon has arrived at Yella's asteroid field and has now crossed back into range of another active Comrade, so his real-time position is now once again being reported, as indicated by both the character history and the tracking marker. There aren't any players in this area, and thus none of this is streamed onto a server. Everything you're seeing is a result of a variety of different services communicating with one another. VMPCs trigger probability volumes just like players, and Yellows shows that there's quite a bit of freighter traffic in this area. So, Dragon won't have to wait very long before he generates an encounter. There's one. Dragon just caused the creation of a freighter, which itself becomes a VMPC so that it can react to what's happening via its own virtual AI. Dragon now engages the freighter. He starts firing on it. He's still within range of an active Comrade, and thus this latest crime is added to his character history. He's now wanted for both murder and piracy, and the bounty on him just jumped from six to 10,000 UEC. See, Increasing this is, the size of the- This is kind of the crazy part of this whole profession, and really the, the part that um, I cannot wait for them to give us an update on this year, because the idea that these NPCs, uh, this system again was, they call back to the Shadow of Mordor games, the Nemesis system they made for that. It's based around that same idea that they're always persisting and doing things and they can gain power. But the idea that like there's an NPC out there that you're tracking for say a day and they're committing crimes and you're seeing this bounty go up, I'm wondering how that experience plays out because does, does anybody really want to spend a whole day tracking somebody down or five hours? How does this factor into a game loop that is fun and also allows a player to experience all of this? Maybe you only experience certain segments of this game loop on certain bounties i don't know um and that's that's really what i don't know here and what we could use an update on this year going into this profession a rap sheet and the price in their head is one of the simplest forms of vmpc evolution and over time we'll look to add additional ways for vmpcs to grow and increase their influence from recruiting followers in an attempt to become a shipping magnet or a crime boss to offering their own missions the captain of that freighter isn't going to surrender so easily. He's broadcast a combat assist service beacon that players can choose to accept, and he's offered a 3,000 UEC reward for his protection. Unfortunately for him, he's pretty heavily outmatched, and he's quickly destroyed, causing the service beacon to expire before anyone can come to his aid. Bits of information like this are fed back to Quantum, and in sufficient quantity will cause all sorts of things to change. How much security patrol missions in that area pay, what transports that have to travel through that area will demand as a risk premium, and how much a ship in distress will offer for someone to come to their aid. The freighter's destruction has left some debris and possibly a few items of value, so if a player had already been en route, they might arrive to find the aftermath. Another murder has now been attributed to Dragon, and the bounty on him just once murder. again jumped, this time from 10 to 14,000 UEC. He took a bit of damage from that encounter and is eventually going to need some repairs. A harder working pirate might look to plunder a few more freighters before heading back, but Dragon's personality attributes oh indicate that once he's got enough cash to cover the basics. Listen to Tony just reading him. A harder working pirate might have actually done something, <laughs> but Dragon. <laughs> more interested in drinking and gambling than piracy. <laughs> so he leaves the area, and once again, the real time location tracking ceases once he's out of range of the Comrade. He's heading back to Port Olisar, which is the closest location that has everything he wants. A fence to sell his stolen goods, shops to repair and restock his ship, and a bar where he can spend the remainder of his cash. The Comrade near Port Olisar has been disabled, which means that Dragon's position isn't updated upon approach. The area remains devoid of any players, and thus it's still not streamed into memory. 
Dragon can therefore remain in his ethereal state and avoid a lot of computational expense related to maneuvering his ship, but he still needs to interface with the air traffic control service to request a landing pad and transition from his ship to the station. Services like this are always fully operational and accessible to VMPCs. That landing so request is logged to his that's history. part of the most complicated part of this game. From, from my perspective, when I think about the way that they're making this, they're trying to make it so that all of the AI do the same things we do. So if you go onto a ship and do some engineering, they want AI to also be able to do that. It might not be the same animations, but the logic is supposed to be there. The the understanding, the affinities, all that's supposed to be there. So if an, if an AI has a bounty and they check in at a city, that city is supposed to um, give them, or they're supposed to send a signal to the city per requir requesting landing. The city is supposed to open a hangar and they're supposed to land their ship. And the game's supposed to track all of that so that you as a bounty hunter can then go and check with the ATC service and see if that person has spawned there. And that might be as simple as going into like a screen on your Mobi glass and clicking the city's service and it says that they're there. We don't know. But the idea that they're supposed to be able to plug into all of the same services that we do, like comma rays and stuff like that, so that we can treat them in the same way we would treat a player bounty is amazing. I hope that there is no difference between tracking a player or an NPC bounty besides, you know, the fact that NPCs are kind of dumb. Then again, so are we. Agree though. So while the disabled comma ray would make it a bit harder for a bounty hunter to track him, there are lots of other ways by which locational information on a character can be obtained. Dragon needed to refuel and repair his ship, and you can see those actions reflected in his history as he interfaces with the shop service that controls those operations. When a VMPC transitions to a landing zone that's streamed in, the virtual AI service that drives their logic temporarily cedes control of the character to the NPC scheduler that specifies who resides at what location. This is the same foundation upon which the dynamic populations feature will be built, except that it will be quantum instead of the virtual AI service dictating the changes in the population. The end result is that if a VMPC is assigned to a landing zone and you're at that location, you can run into them like any other NPC. Dragon is now hanging out in local bar, which was added to Port Allstar for the purposes of this demo. If you were to walk into the bar at this moment, he'd be physicalized with the rest of the environment and you'd actually see him there. Dragon eventually gets his fill of entertainment, or maybe he just runs out of money. Either way, it's back to work, and he'll be jetting back to Yellow to try and prey on more unprotected cargo ships. So, he contacts air traffic control to get clearance to leave the area and departs. The same player that Dragon first encountered, and killed, is looking to exact some revenge, though, and claim the big bounty on Dragon's head. They've surmised that there might be a pattern to Dragon's movement, and think that he might head back out to Yella. So, they position themselves between Port Olisar, where they know that Dragon just left, and Yella and activate a quantum interdiction field. Dragon, still in his lightweight ethereal form, initiates a quantum jump from Port Olisar to Yella and, just like a player, routes that movement through the probability volume service that is responsible for interdictions. Once he gets within range of the player's interdiction bubble, his jump is interrupted and he transitions from executing virtual AI on the back end to a full-blown subsumption-driven AI executing logic on a server so that the two of them can battle it out. If the player once again gets the worst of it, they might decide to change up their tactics a bit and wait to see if Dragon soon returns to Port Olisar, where they could try to sneak up on him on foot. So, yeah, that's bounty hunting. It's a long process, and how they split that up and make it something that's easily digestible by, say, a new player, as opposed to, like, a very in-depth bounty, might be the difference between how missions are split up. Like, maybe... As a newcomer bounty hunter, they might send you on really simple um, go here, kill this person, get paid kind of missions. And then as you get better, they'll start to be like, okay, we need you to bring in this person alive. Okay, this person's in a spaceship out here. Okay, we don't even know that this person is. Go find them. And maybe that's the progression of difficulty for bounty hunting, but we don't, we don't know. They haven't said anything about it. It's been on the progress tracker multiple times. If not, it might still be there. Let's see. Um, for years it was very much supposed to be in the game last year if we look at the letter from the chairman i got receipts bro december 30th 2022 bounty hunting bounty hunter v2 enabling players to track criminals via a mobi glass security app linked to distress beacons comma rays air traffic control systems cameras and npc informants those bounty hunters shout out or the bartenders i mean 
This will rely on various new backend tech, including virtual AI, the NPC scheduler, and security service. So we've already, we, we looked into all of those. Um, virtual AI, the stuff we just read about, was having a lot of work from the systems and services team, 117 weeks worth of work. Um, that's not including, not accounting for breaks in here. The NPC scheduler, which determines what NPCs are spawning in which places. Scheduler, there we go. Uh, that was doing work, 130 weeks of work on the EU landing zone team and systems and services team, not including um, breaks. Up until Q3, the NPC scheduler was going. So even if virtual AI was done on here for a while, the NPC scheduler was still quite well under work. I can't believe they haven't presented anything on this, not even at CitizenCon. The last thing we had there was security service which has also been in the works for a while. Security Network V1 and V2, V0. Um, the new version is supposed to allow features like locked doors and elevators based on clearance level like um, reputation. There, This stuff's been in the works and they've clearly got a lot of it done. I don't know why they didn't present it at CitizenCon, especially after in the year prior, the end of 2022, we had Chris Roberts himself come out and say that um, in 2023, they want to have bounty hunting with a full tracking system and the ability to actively restrain and transport players and AI. I know that got set back, but it's weird that they didn't give us any updates on that at, uh, at CitizenCon. So now let me show you probability volumes real quick. Because I did say I was going to give you a look at that so you could understand. Let me just see. Here we go. Here's probability volumes in action. This is kind of virtual AI are, are the named characters you're going to meet that matter. Um, but there's also all of those quanta that are spawning in based on where you are and what you're doing. And they might not be named. They might be named. But those are like the combat beacons that you run across. These are the pirates that you go and take out when you're trying to take out the Arlington game, stuff like this. So this system probability volumes are how those sort of cannon fodder NPCs will be spawned in for us to just generally play the game while we're out and about in the verse. They offer to pay mercenaries to come to their aid. This is fundamentally different than the brute force tactics we currently rely upon to create missions and dictate when they're available. And it's far more flexible and powerful. What you're really seeing here are the first signs of the dynamic mission system starting to flicker to life. And once it hits full stride, it's going to transform the gameplay experience. Next, let's take a look at how dynamic events allow encounter probabilities and interdiction frequencies to be adjusted. This is the probability volume around Port Olisar. You can see that piracy, the red curve, and security, the blue, are inversely related. All things being equal, if you increase the amount of security, you'll get less piracy and vice versa. Security tends to congregate closer to the landing facilities and dissipate as you get farther out, and thus piracy tends to gradually increase with distance. All right, so here's that same thing that we were seeing before. You can see up here that we've got a, a, a percentage chance of, I think this is freighters, 17.87% percentage chance per minute. So every minute you have a 18% chance of finding a freighter when you are within one kilometer of Port Alisar. Go out to 150 kilometers, much less percent chance. And because of that, you got to 150, or no, I'm sorry, not because of that. That's the freighter curve. The blue is security, as he'll explain. And you can see that security is obviously stronger out at the space station than they are way outside. That correlates to two things. One, freighters are obviously less popular out there because they need to be at the space station, but also because it's more dangerous. And two, pirates in the red curve are more popular out there because that correlates. Less security, more pirates, more pirates, less freighters. The balance of the... the um, probability volume curves. These will be applied to all locations and they will dictate how you run into NPCs when you're approaching those locations. In fact, this is maybe how Blockade Runner is gonna function. We'll have to see. The likelihood of an encounter is represented by the height of the curve at that distance. Notice that the chances of running into a freighter, the green curve, is pretty much constant because once a ship has decided to make the journey to or from Port Olsar, it's committed. They've already decided whether or not the risk is worth the reward of traveling the full route. 
I'm now going to activate the lockdown phase of this event, which is going to crank up the amount of piracy in the selected area and overwhelm security. The red curve, piracy, now has a much larger average height, equating to an increased encounter probability. And because pirates now greatly outnumber security, the curve pushes in much closer to the landing zone. The criminals are emboldened because there's no longer sufficient security to deter them. The blue curve, security, looks identical, although Quantum will, over time, start adjusting the economic levers to gradually increase the amount of security to combat the threat by offering greater rewards. Increased piracy has had an immediate impact, though, on freighter traffic, which has dropped precipitously. This means that the local economy will start to seize up. They won't be able to import food, medicine, fuel, or whatever else they need, and they won't be able to export whatever goods and services they produce. All of these knock-on effects are only possible because designers will now be able to nudge the economic gears in proper systemic fashion. Let's test one of these knock-on effects. Now that we've adjusted the encounter probabilities, let's see what that does to quantum travel in the area. I'm going to once again bring up a game client, this time so that we can watch an Avenger Titan jumping to Port Olisar. This is a short jump and the chances of interdiction would typically be very slim. Now that we've injected a much larger pirate presence around that location, however, that's no longer the case. We got ejected from our jump as soon as we got within range of those elevated pirate probabilities, which means that getting to Port Olisar just got a lot more difficult and time consuming and will remain that way until the threat is addressed. We're now to the point where we can allow programmatic modification of these data structures and Quantum will soon start adjusting these automatically so that all sorts of things within the universe start to ebb and flow. What all of this really means is that even when you know that you can buy medical supplies dirt cheap at one location and sell them for a hefty profit at another, we can finally start to adjust some of the systemic elements to justify the disparity. In short, if you wanted to take advantage of Port Olisar's elevated prices right now, you'd have to fly the last mile at conventional speeds and we'll probably see quite a bit of combat. That's going to drive up how long it takes you to make the run. You're probably going to burn quite a bit more ammo and require more repairs than would otherwise be the case. And you might want to think about recruiting some armed escorts to help you through the dangerous areas. Once the risk abates, once players in Quanta have dispatched enough of the pirates so that travel within this area returns to normal, you'll be able to much more easily deliver medical supplies to Port Olisar, but of course that increase in supply will quickly shrink the price differential. Now let's take a look at how each server can host part of a larger event while the things that really matter can remain synchronized. I'm going to enable the war phase by calling the start war function. That's going to create some staged battles involving the ship types we selected earlier around Port Olsar, the area that we previously selected. I brought up a couple of different client windows, each of which represents a different server. As each cutlass is destroyed on either server, the shared variable called enemies remaining is decremented. Once that variable reaches zero, the war phase will automatically terminate and the victory phase will be activated. All right, this is kind of getting into global events. We don't need to talk about that. Um, this was, though, generally the full update on what quantum is. And now that we've gotten past that, I was going to dip into this talk a little bit, but this one is very theory crafty. What is this? I think this I think we might have gotten one update here. This is October 2021. So this is like pretty shortly after this. Um, but this is I think the last video update at least we got on what's going on with quantum. Let's see if there's anything here. About the rest of the game. I want to pivot now and give an update on some of the systemic functionality that I detailed last spring. I said that we were soon going to have quantum controlling a few select bits of the universe and that we were going to be very measured in the rollout. We remain on track to activate these changes with 3.16 at the end of the year, and this initial release will allow quantum to dictate three encounter frequencies, the prices of three commodities, and everything related to combat assist service beacons. As the simulation is refined and more of the linkage to the game is completed, we will expand the scope of these early tests and enable quantum to play an ever larger role in shaping the universe. So let's go over how the gameplay experience is set to change. Probability volumes dictate how the likelihood of an encounter type varies within that region, and historically that information has always been static. Dynamic events, introduced in early 2021, allow that data to be changed by mission logic, but still don't support systemic modulation. You can see the frequency curve for pirate activity in a few minutes later. Up until now, all of our dynamic events have been manually all triggered right. by someone loading. So I'm pretty sure he didn't actually give an update on quantum, dude. Like, what? Please tell, tell, please, so we can go to the next year.
address at the top right, and below that you can see the input parameters that it was sent, which include the Raven's Roost location and a numeric value of 916 for the total purchase drugs variable, which the actual Jumptown V2 logic uses to configure how many free units of drugs the location will produce over the lifetime of the event. Few moments later. The ultimate purpose of systemic triggers then is to allow us to easily and programmatically dictate when and exactly how handcrafted custom content will be layered onto the background tapestry driven by quantum systemic logic. More moments later. More engaging and unique than what either technology could deliver by itself. Ah, a conclusion. Yes. That's it for our show today. I hope that you now have a better sense of some of the things we're aiming to accomplish over the next year and that you're as excited as we are about the potential of these new features and technologies to really transform the gameplay experience. Until next time. That face is kind of how I feel. <laughs> I remember this being my least favorite panel of this Citizen Con. I don't even think I watched this whole thing. I think we watched it together when we were live. I never went back and watched this because it was so just it's like, what are you, what, why, why? Yeah, this was a, a pretty disappointing panel in my opinion. Um, so not much of an update regarding quantum there. There are a couple things that I have here though. I honestly don't remember now what these clips were saying. I think these were about some of the details. Um, let's listen to these two clips and then we'll get into the monthly reports and that will explain kind of more of what's actually going on. The videos will tell you some stuff, monthly reports will tell you what's actually happening and we have gotten some updates since then. So we'll go over those in a second. I just wanna see what I tried to save here and why. Back on the, the, the discussion of loot and rarity from the live chat here, um, do you, I'm trying to think how to reword this. Right, how do, uh, right, 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 right. This video is about um, the idea of resources and things being placed in certain places and that spurring the idea of demand and supply in the economy. Not a big thing. It's obviously stuff that we just went over, but it's interesting to hear from the devs who are actually working on the gameplay side of it as opposed to just the theoretical economy side. And it's a little more updated info. Many games have like predefined levels of rarity. There, there's, there's like common, uncommon rare, epic, legendary, to use the WoW model. Do we have those levels set? Do you, are, 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 you, are you at a place where you can share with us what are the rarity levels referred to as? And do they have so, colors? They definitely don't have colors. We're, we're, oh. we're, not, we're not doing that. Um, it would not fit with the sort of level of, of realism that we're, we're going for. Um, we do have some fixed rarity tiers of loot boxes um and at, at the moment uh off the top of my head i think we've got common uncommon rare but um what that means is not a, a global setting uh so what uh how how likely you are to find a rare loot box is not going to be the same in every location and its contents are not going to be the same in every location. Um, it's something that the designers are thinking a lot about of how to balance uh, what crates and what contents you get where. Um, yeah, uh, and it's also something that we are having ongoing discussions with the economy team about how we balance the amount of value you can get out of containers. Also, in, rare for Stanton doesn't mean that it's rare in Pyro, for example. So items that you are more likely to find in Stanton are probably less likely to find in Pyro. Gotcha. Like yeah, water. That's a very good point. <laughs> Clean water. So when we talk about rarity, we are not talking about stats. We are not talking about uh, 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 this thing is be not using it in the traditional WoW model where you know every time you fight this thing it drops a, 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 a an epic thing. It's, we are talking about rarity in the truest sense of its word and how difficult it is to find, how difficult it is to acquire. And what you're saying is that items will be rare in pyro but not necessarily rare in stanton and then vice versa yeah you know it, it's it's we're t taking it from a holistic uh it's, story it's it's a quality rather than a stat like the rarity is that you just can't find it rather than a number assigned to the item uh, not a huge update i think that's 
that's pretty clear, but uh, an interesting, I guess, topic when it comes to loot. Here's another talk, though. This is the EUPU team. No, this is the USPU team. The last one was EUPU. These people are now the NAPU team as they have combined with the Montreal team. Great developers. Big fan of the Montreal team. Um, I have no idea what this is about, though. Let's hear what they have to say. Plans for that. Uh... Adjacent to the cargo refactor, and we'll get back to that in a minute. Cargo stuff, that's right. We now had to touch on cargo before we go. So we got about 20 to 30 minutes, and we'll get to that. Cargo refactor include a meaningful overhaul of the economy itself uh, for updated profit and investment ratios. I, I think it has to. Um, you know, one of the things that we want to do is, is sell things kind of by the box, not like this per unit, because the, it does a lot of different things when we start to go down that road where uh it takes a certain amount of money to get into a box a super valuable box that's this big um whereas you know i can, I can get into like the, the really cheap stuff in larger volumes maybe they're really expensive stuff i can only buy in, in smaller quantities but i've got to get a certain amount of it in order to it's like buying a lot size on the on the stock market right you got to buy it in 100 unit lots uh, similar principle uh with what we want to do for the cargo and it and it kind of ties to you know, the whole sea in these large containers that, that we need to, to have to facilitate those. Um, but it, it's abs I, I don't see how we can't, you know, do that. Like it's, it's mandatory, 100%. So for those who missed that answer, he's, he's essentially saying um, the cargo refactor will indeed call for us to have an economy refactor. That's one of the things that they've been holding back on. Um, another one of those things is locations and having more economic nodes and just the scale that's large enough to make the economy make sense. But like the cargo refactor was also a part of making sure that this, this whole economic change would work. Talking to you about different aspects of cargo and freight on behalf of Art and Design. My name is Nick Etheridge, and I'm an assistant environment art director. So obviously, cargo isn't just about boxes. It's a big part of the game. Almost every aspect of the game has some kind of involvement with cargo. And I'm going to briefly go through some of them now. So let's start with missions. How will hauling contracts work in-game? We'll be introducing the Interstellar Transport Guild, as well as form as well as formalizing some of the main hauling and cargo companies that you'll be working with. As you do more hauling contracts, you will build up your reputation and relationship with the guild. This will lead you to gaining more lucrative contracts for specialized cargo and destinations, such as different forms of hazardous cargo, perishable cargo, riskier routes, and more. So what do I mean by hazardous and perishable? Well, as you know, there's lots of commodities in the game, and different commodities have different properties. As you know, with events like Xenothreat, we have some special cargo types with different attributes, such as time-sensitive cargo or quantum-sensitive cargo. But those were a small selection for the event, and they were the two-handed carryable types anyway. We'll be expanding those types plus lots more types to the wider game and to these hauling contracts. So how does this affect gameplay? It will affect the choices you make when you are handling, storing, and traveling with the cargo. For example, with size and weight, is it carryable? Do you need a tractor beam? What type of tractor beam do you need? Is it a handheld one or a ship tractor beam? Some containers can only be moved with ship tractor beams, for example. With health, has the container got good... I am very curious. All of these concepts, I believe, uh, as you'll notice as we flip through these different pictures... Actually, no, it's not all these concepts. Most of these concepts? No, all of these concepts have little screens on them. Makes me wonder if that's going to be how, they access, how we access inventories for these boxes instead of the like paper doll kind of thing that we're doing right now. Beams, for example. With health, has the container got good integrity? Is it holding fragile goods? Do you need to handle it with care? You can't just throw all containers about. For temperature control, do you need to ensure the container is powered so it can keep the contents cool? 
Or do you need to get to your destination quickly, um, otherwise the contents may perish? For security, can the container be locked or hacked? Can the contents be scanned or is the container tracked? Will there be pirates or law after you when you're holding this container? Has a containment? Is it radioactive? You might need the right uh, protection against it, as you may have seen in Jens's presentation earlier. Can it explode? You might not want to put these containers on a more exposed section of your ship. And many of these attributes are, are going to be visually distinctive. So conversely, if you want to steal, for example, some cargo on a hull C, which does have very exposed cargo containers, you might want to avoid shooting blindly and accidentally blowing up your potential profits. So look out for those types of containers. Back to mission progression. We'll be introducing perks and rewards as part of fulfilling contracts and raising reputation with these companies. For rewards, we'll have branded ship and tool skins, branded clothing. There will be collectibles to decorate your hab, hangar, or ship, or you can put them anywhere you want. And there'll be more exclu exclusive rewards that we'll be revealing later. For <laughs> Thank you. For perks, you'll get access to more items in shops and discounts on specific items. And all of these rewards and perks you need to earn in the game. You cannot just buy them. And then we all lost our minds, because that is one of the best things. Being able to earn things in-game for in-game, only in-game is pretty nice. I'm sorry, I'm going to go back here real quick, because I was gone for a second. I wanted to hear what he said here as you may have seen in Jens's presentation earlier. Can it explode? You might not want to put these containers on a more exposed section of your ship. And many of these attributes are, are going to be visually distinctive. So conversely, if you want to steal, for example, some cargo on a hull C, which does have very exposed cargo containers, you might want to avoid shooting blindly and accidentally blowing up your potential profits. So look out for those types of containers. Back to mission progression. We'll be okay. That's all I wanted to know. So this is a this is a big deal, and I think a really key indicator that the economy is going going to continue its work. Um, because in addition to this, the stuff we're about to read with the monthly reports, I hope I can find stuff about cargo. Let me get another search here. Um, Monthly report, and that was probably April, maybe April or, or March. Clearly you can't do these sort of cargo missions without creating that demand in some way. And um, that the demand could come, it could be artificial. They could just say, oh, this is a mission with a certain amount of cargo, but I think it'd be easier for them to spawn these cargo missions based on um, nope. Um, I think it would be easier to make this based on just plugging it all into the system and having that run through the different things that you could be picking up um, or the different places you could pick up from. So like if they wanted to spawn a cargo mission, instead of just plugging in the idea that you have to run a cargo mission from Lorville to Microtech, I feel like they could just affect the commodities and that would spawn the missions. Kind of like how probability volumes are supposed to spawn bounty hunting missions. But that's not confirmed. That's just kind of my own speculation as to something that may be pointing towards them working towards this stuff. And I'm trying to find that those lines here in the monthly reports, but I cannot find it. Cargo generation. Uh, first air traffic control assistant for cargo. I don't know. I don't know where this is. Might be, might not be able to find the specific monthly report. Let me try February. Cargo. Current state of cargo, no. Um, cargo features. 
The ship cargo steal and recover hauling mission has been taken as far as it can until further cargo features are de developed. I don't think that's a thing in game yet. In the meantime, we will make sure courier version in which small items are the objective. What is this, August? Yeah, I don't think that's a thing, but I also, I'm not sh Man, this is weird. I can't find that. There is an ISC about cargo, but there's definitely a monthly report that talked about cargo missions. Disappointed I can't find that right now. Okay, let's actually look at the real quantum economy progress. The whole freaking reason we're here, <laughs> what might happen this year with quantum and what, what messaging do we actually have on it? Sorry for making you wait the whole time for it. I promise it wasn't a strategy. I just really like talking about the economy. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I'm telling me that you have nothing here. Okay, so this is April 2023 month report. This is uh, eight months ago, about or so, give or take. This is before they formed the economy team, but there was technically an economy team. It just wasn't called the economy team or referenced. Um, but they did have the systemic services and tools team, and we can see that they were getting some of their stuff updated. So service beacons were undergoing their refactor. Um, and they completed shop optimizations and began prototyping mission markers for bounty hunting. That is for virtual AI. They're currently preparing to work on the virtual NPC service. That's the work that we saw um, just now in the in the progress, in the video stuff. And then the team planned out the next set of milestones for the Quantum Odin tool too. So Quantum and Odin are the tools that they use, the graphical interfaces that we've been looking at. As you can see... See if he lists it here anywhere. Yes, you can see Odin up here in the top corner. And then quantum, obviously. We've heard that word enough today. Quantum time, baby. <laughs> if only it was quantum time. So yeah, the quantum simulation and Odin tool, we're seeing work. Um, back in April and before that. It's not like they were just starting them, but monthly reports are important. Now we've got the next month, May 2023, an update from the Systemic Services and Tools team. Uh, Systemic Services and Tools spent the month working towards bounty hunting V2, including finalizing upstream work on the character creation service, R&D for bounty contract missions, a bounty hunter, a bounty marker prototype, and connecting the NPC tracker service to the game server. That's a lot of work going into bounty hunting on the back end, right? We saw front end updates with things like restraining here. Um, so like clearly the gameplay teams are working on the stuff that the services teams are working on and bounty hunting is pretty far along. This is this is May. This isn't even like November monthly report. So this is part of why I thought it was kind of weird that it didn't show up at CitizenCon, but they can't show everything, right? They need to be able to hype up Q1, Q2 of the next year with something that they've been working on. They can't just show us a bunch of prototypes. So they also gave us an update on Quantum. Uh, they continue to work on the Quantum and Odin tool, including making progress on the data-driven economy, Quanta State, Quanta Life, and the Battle Matrix and Battle System. So in-depth work going into the Quantum economy, clearly it's not like nothing's going on. They continued these updates throughout the year with another update coming in in August. Mm. And in August, they finally split out a new team. So the Systemic Services and Tools team uh, spit out an economy team that is more properly formatted and focused on building out all aspects surrounding the economy in Star Citizen. So finally... There is, an, there, there is a true team of heralds for the market. For the free market, the UEE. It's probably not a free market. The UEE kind of sucks. So what they said about the economy team in August is the first month they had it running. The new economy team planned their upcoming goals, including rebalancing cargo and the related experience, including cargo and the related experience. Hold on, wait for it. What's this? Cargo and the related experience. They're, they're working together on this. They're definitely doing some things and they're not telling us what. They also began building a tool to investigate the current state of cargo. Hey, look, more cargo, which could be expanded to other areas of the in-game economy. Now, just to be sure I'm not missing anything here, I will go back and search specifically for cargo. But the economy team is working on cargo stuff. 
that much is certain as early as August as a as their own focus team. You guys remember what happened to missions once the missions team started to get their their things, their pots on the stove, for lack of a better term, their their picos in a cave. Next month, September, the economy team said uh, they have set up shops at three jump point stations to provide the Hull Sea and other cargo ships with additional trade routes. Not a big deal, but it does show that the economy team is ready to do changes on a monthly basis to help support the gameplay that's coming in. Whereas all these times that we were hearing about this before, these were like, oh, yes, we have a big picture that's going to come about at some point. Now that we have an actual economy team focusing on the game, things are fundamentally different. They're focusing on the actual game at hand rather than the massive simulation that needs to come someday. They're still working on this, but clearly they're starting to make meaningful changes to the game in real time. And that's why I think even if we don't see quantum simulation as a whole this year, we're definitely going to see changes around cargo um, and, and other things that do make us at least notice the economy more. They also worked on rebalancing commodity trading in Stanton and Pyro as part of a large initiative, larger initiative to improve the gameplay experience for haulers and traders. Again, stuff we haven't seen. This isn't from September. Economy team then supported other teams such as character art and interactables with pricing for new player equipment, balancing prices so that it makes more sense based on how we're looting and earning. Lastly, the tool that extracts live game data to help inform the profitability of various game loop, gameplay loops and assist in balancing was completed. Somebody was asking actually if they used Quantum to track all these statistics that they get from players. This tool will probably help them a lot more with that and it's I think separate from Quantum but slightly related. Mission Features worked alongside Economy to more accurately balance the cargo manifest seen in Salvage Bounty and Assassin's Missions to ensure they don't break the economy. Again, another example of the Economy team stepping in to make real-time changes to the game rather than focusing just on that long-term vision they have. So in October, the Economy team continued balancing the probability, profitability of commodities for Pyro and Stanton, so they just continued what they were doing. They also began reviewing and balancing the AUEC prices of vehicles, identifying various criteria to help inform how they should be priced to better reflect their current potential. That's a huge deal. The, the prices of vehicles will dictate the prices of materials or vice versa, and the prices of materials are the whole point of why we do salvage and mining and all that stuff. That's, that's the economy itself. The makeup and value of the most valuable and important objects in the game, spaceships, are probably going to drive a lot of what makes the game function. And they're actively doing that now, at least as of October. Similarly, they started balancing the prices of armor using an algorithmic approach based on information pulled from live game data. Vehicle and armor price balancing feeds into the team's goal to holistically balance effort versus reward across the game and provide other, other teams with guidelines on how to price items in the future. Economy also supported other teams on gameplay features, including the vehicle tractor beam, salvage contracts, and the profitability of loot found in vehicle wrecks. Additional support was provided for various events, including CitizenCon, the Intergalactic Aerospace Expo, the F8C Hunt, and the Day of the Vara. So when I say that like things are different from before, I'm I'm not I'm not being being hyperbolic. I'm not being like it's not copium. Things are literally different. We could go back to 2021 October and see what they're saying about the economy. I guarantee you, though, it has nothing to do with the game actually working. In October, the Systemic Services and Tools team wrapped up their ongoing work on the economy tools and AI simulation. They're now focusing on optimization for the remainder of the year. The new gameplay feature mentioned last month continued its development. Work progress on intelligent NPCs spawning and tracking, with the latter, has, uh, latter half of the spawning system progressing well. Tracking system continues towards its first major internal milestone. See, it's, I mean, this first part is at least optimization for something over the course of the year. But a lot of this stuff was like very much, I guess they did help on the inventory system at least, very much back end kind of focused on the the whole system kind of thing and they I guess they talked about that a little bit here when they talk about like the quantum and Odin tools but the differences of balancing commodities and materials in the game versus um 
just working on the actual economic system, I think, makes a bigger difference to us because we're playing the game. We can't see their internal system being built. And that kind of feedback of the game we're playing changing makes a bigger difference to players. Throughout September, Systemic Services and Tool Team continued to work on the economy tools and quantum the AI simulation. Edge cases were also wrapped up for easier use in recording. So again, it's it's mostly work, work, work. And a lot of stuff on server meshing. They actually had a lot to do with the transition over to server meshing. But that's that wraps it up, folks. I hope that gave you a little bit of a look into not only what the economy simulation is supposed to be or the overall simulation of Star Citizen, but kind of where we're headed for this year. Things to look out for in 2024 regarding the economy um, are cargo missions, commodity prices all starting to change to better reflect how ships are realistically supposed to be priced, virtual AI in bounty hunting, and I guess the, the, the increasing of probability volumes making a difference on the missions we get. I don't know how much that's actually going to change this year, but those first three, specifically paying attention to how cargo hauling and trading are going to change throughout this year. And then virtual AI with bounty hunting, I think, are two of the big tells. But they talked a lot here. Oh, they talked a lot about the cargo missions. So that's where I think we should be focusing. And hopefully what we see by this summer. Uh, I don't think it'll happen, but I hope we see them by the summer. Either way, for 2024, there's no way the economy stays at stagnant as it has been. Uh, I think we can say that pretty confidently. And I think that's true for quite a few parts of the game. But, uh, you know, believe it when you see it. We'll wait until Q1 update, maybe Q up, Q2 update to see what they're actually doing and putting out this year. Mm -hmm.